This course is about basic mathematical tools and techniques that engineers use. Engineers need to design and build systems to perform some desired task. Often this involves testing systems and data analysis, analyzing systems mathematically, and when necessary using computer simulations to analyze systems that are too complicated to analyze by hand. This video introduces the way engineers use mathematics and how their viewpoint of mathematics might differ from a mathematician's. Almost all engineering design tasks require you to be able to do mathematics, which is why your first couple of years in engineering school include a lot of math classes. However, in my experience, the way engineers actually use math is almost the opposite of the way it's introduced in school. Engineers are generally more interested in deciding what mathematics adequately describes the system rather than trying to get a correct solution to a given math problem. More importantly, engineers usually neither need nor want an absolutely accurate mathematical representation of a system. In fact, a completely accurate mathematical solution to an engineering problem is probably impossible. So we just want a solution that's good enough. Remember that an engineer's goal is to design a system that performs some desired task. We always have some flexibility in our design approach, so we can always create our design to account for shortcomings in our mathematical analysis. Many systems, especially those upon which human lives depend, may be designed to be four times as strong as the analysis indicates that they need to be. This is sometimes called a factor of safety or a design margin. Essentially, the idea is that we accept the idea that our analysis may be wrong and we design the system to account for this. Another aspect of the design process is that it's iterative. This means that we start with a prelim preliminary design and then use subsequent analysis and test data to modify the design as necessary. This means that we need to be flexible on how we describe the system mathematically. Test data on preliminary designs may completely change the mathematics we want to use to describe the system. We need to be familiar with a wide variety of mathematics in order to be able to modify the mathematics to describe the observed behavior of the system. Now let's talk about what we mean by an engineering system and how we mathematically describe systems. An engineering system is a group of components that perform some desired task. The task is usually associated with moving energy around to perform some useful work or to transfer information from one place to another. One example of this is using a pump to move water from place to place. In an electric pump, we would provide electrical energy to the pump and the pump converts that electrical energy into pressure which can be used to push water around. Another example is a frying pan on a gas cooktop. The input would be the heat applied from the gas burner to the frying pan. The frying pan converts that heat input to the temperature of the pan. As engineers, we need to be able to predict how this energy transfer happens so that we can make it happen as efficiently as possible. To do this, we build mathematical models to describe the energy transfer. The model is based on an identification of what we consider to be the inputs and outputs of the system. Sometimes it's convenient to represent this in what is called a block diagram. On a typical block diagram, arrows represent the input and the output. The input is something that comes from outside the system, and the output is what the system converts this to. In our pump example, the input may be the voltage applied to the pump, and the output is the rate of flow the pump creates. The system is described by a mathematical relationship that gives the output as a function of the input. Our job is to decide what math relates the input to the output and use that information to design the system. As an example of this, I'll create a mathematical model for a spring. I've got a spring here attached to the ceiling. I'm going to add weight to the spring in the form of washers. That will stretch the spring. I'll measure the distance between the ceiling and the bottom of the spring, record that here, and come up with a mathematical relationship between that distance and the number of washers. With no washers attached to the spring, the bottom of the spring is about 12 inches from the ceiling. If I add a washer to this,
and remeasure the distance, my distance is about 23 inches. With two washers, the distance increases to 34 inches. Now let's take a look at what our mathematical relationship is going to be. I'm going to assume that the distance x is equal to some number, a times the number of washers, w, plus another number, b. With zero washers, x is 12. So 12 is equal to a times 0 plus b, which means that b is equal to 12 inches. If I add one washer, I get an increase in distance of 11 inches. Adding a second washer increases the distance by another 11 inches. So x increases by 11 inches for every additional washer. So a is equal to 11, and my equation becomes x is equal to 11 times w plus 12. Now I've got a mathematical relationship between x and the number of washers. This can be evaluated for any value of w. So if I have a weight attached to the spring that corresponds to one and a half washers, I can use this equation to decide what x should be. This block diagram approach towards representing a system can be used in a variety of ways. The first and easiest is analysis. In analysis, we know the mathematical model for the system and the input, and we need to find the output of the system. So in our spring example, if we know A and the weight applied to the spring, we can find the expected displacement. This is the closest to a typical problem in a mathematics class. Another option is model estimation. In this process, we apply some input to the system, measure the output, and use the data to estimate a mathematical model for the system. We did this for our spring example by applying a few different weights to the spring, measuring the corresponding displacements, and then we created an approximate relationship between the input and the output, which we can use to estimate the displacement for any weight that we hang off the spring. This requires a broader mathematical insight than analysis, in that we need to be able to choose among a variety of mathematical models to find one that best replicates the relationship between the input and the output. In design, we generally know what response we need as a result of some input, and we need to decide what system to implement. In design, we not only need to identify a desired mathematical relationship between the input and the output, but we also need to be able to create a physical system that has that relationship. Most engineering tasks require all of the above. We can use test data to identify models for components. We can use these data to predict the component's response to expected inputs, and then redesign the components as necessary to obtain a desired behavior. Now let's look at how the relationships between a system's input and output can be used to develop a more complex system design. A home heating system is an example of how this might work. Our typical interface with our heating system is the thermostat. The thermostat accepts two inputs, the desired temperature and the actual temperature in the house. The outputs a decision whether to turn the furnace on or off. There are several design decisions here. If we turn on the heater immediately when the temperature goes below the desired temperature and turn it off immediately when the temperature exceeds the desired temperature, we'll probably end up turning the furnace on and off almost constantly, which can burn out the furnace. If we wait until there's a large difference between the desired and the actual temperatures before turning the furnace on or off, the people in the house will probably be either uncomfortably warm or cold most of the time. Therefore, we need a model of the heat output from the furnace to decide how quickly to we add heat to the house. The actual house temperature depends not only on the heat input from the furnace, but also the rate at which heat is leaving the house. An older, drafty house will lose heat rapidly, while a newer, well-insulated house will lose heat slowly. We may want to base our decision on how quickly to turn heat on or off on the rate at which the house loses heat. 
Finally, the thermostat relies on a measured temperature. The measured temperature depends on the location of the temperature measurement system. Predicting in advance the behavior of this overall system is difficult. However, the individual components of the system are probably fairly readily modeled by testing components individually. Then, if we have models for the individual components, it's relatively easy to develop an overall system model. Furthermore, we can determine the effects of changing individual components on the response of the overall system. Engineers always need to keep in mind that the mathematical model they use is different on some level from the actual physical system. Another way to think of this is that any physical system can be mathematically modeled in a variety of ways. Our goal is to determine the simplest mathematical model for a system that provides us with a solution that's good enough for the application at hand. An obvious problem with this is deciding what is good enough, which always depends on the problem we're solving. A frying pan will be my example of what this means. As an example of what I'm talking about, let's look at this frying pan on a gas range. If I turn on the range, I get these flames in an annular region. If I put the frying pan on the flames, the pan will heat up. There's a variety of things I might be interested in about this. Maybe I just want the final temperature on average in the pan after it gets hot. Or maybe I want the average temperature as a function of time as it heats up. That's going to be a lot harder calculation. Or maybe the average temperature isn't good enough. Maybe I want a temperature distribution. Parts of the frying pan will get hotter than other parts of the pan. If I want a distribution, I have to calculate the temperatures at a lot of different points in the pan. That could be hundreds or thousands of unknowns. But regardless of the complexity of the model, remember, the physical system is always the same. So, it's important to realize that the mathematical model of the system is different from the physical system itself. In our frying pan example, we had a couple of ways we could represent the frying pan temperature. However, the actual system, the frying pan and the stove burner, is the same for both cases. What has changed is the level of detail in our mathematical model of the system. If we only need an average temperature, we probably only need a single unknown in our model. If we need a temperature distribution in the pan, we may need hundreds or even thousands of variables for the temperatures at a variety of points in the frying pan. The mathematical model of a system is separate from the physical system itself. And it doesn't imply that a large expensive system is modeled by a large expensive mathematical model. In fact, the opposite is often true. In an elaborate bridge truss system, it's usually fairly simple to estimate the average loads in each of the beams in the truss. On the other hand, if you shake a cupful of sand, it's nearly impossible to predict the position of each grain of sand in the cup. Finally, let's look at some of the tools engineers use to create and work with mathematical models. Most engineering models are based on measured data. In order to interpret measured data, we need some familiarity with measurement systems. Most data and information is represented by voltages. This means that data analysis requires some understanding of the measurement of electrical parameters such as voltage. Another primary tool engineers use is computer modeling. The mathematics governing most engineering systems are far too complex to solve analytically using a pencil and paper. This means that engineers often use computers to determine the responses of complicated systems. The most important aspect of engineering modeling and analysis is mathematics. You'll need to be able to generate an appropriate mathematical model for a system. This requires you to be proficient in a variety of mathematical analysis techniques and to be able to choose the appropriate mathematical model for a set of measured data. An analogy would be knowing when to use a hammer versus a screwdriver. Even if you use a computer model to predict the system response, you still need to be able to check the results of your model against expectations. Never trust the results of a computer simulation unless you perform some simple checks on those results. This video provided some insight into the mathematical tools that engineers use to model systems. Engineers will always prefer the simplest model for a system that adequately describes the system's response. Usually, the simplest model for a system will be a linear relationship between the system's input 
and output. In the next video, we'll talk about linear systems and why engineers like them so much.